Thank you, Joe. And thank you all for coming here to South Massa today. Uh, colorectal awareness. Uh, you know, every cancer has its own color. And blue was selected for colon because blue is the strength of resilience. We all wear blue for that. And colon cancer is something which is very preventable. You'll hear from Dr. Amajoy today regarding that. You know, in the U.S., 140,000 cases are diagnosed every year, and we lose 50,000 patients every year. And this is one cancer which is completely preventable. So it makes really a good sense to not only take care of yourself, but also your friends and colleagues. So with the information that you gather here today, please take it out to your community, and we are here to help you. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Amajan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, uh, part of our roles as doctors is to um, educate the uh, public. And uh, here at South Nassau, that's what we like to do. That's what we intend to do moving forward. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why uh, folks don't undergo colorectal cancer screening is uh, due to fear of finding something. And the reason for that fear is lack of understanding of polyps or how colorectal cancer forms. Uh, today, we hope to uh, shed light on what polyps are and how colorectal cancer uh, forms so that way uh, we can, uh, uh, folks can actually proceed and undergo colorectal cancer screening um, uh, with no fear and empower folks to do that. So, <clears throat> polyps. Polyps are basically precancerous lesions. Uh, basically, what happens is a single cell in the colon, in the colon, in the colon uh, develops some sort of mutations that uh, prevents the cell to control its uh, growth, multiplication, and division. So what happens is that that cell hyperproliferates and uh, leads to a polyp, and over time that polyp uh, can uh, develop cancer and because uh, other mutations can occur. And uh, uh, if the polyp is not removed, the cancer develops. This process can take anywhere from five to 10 years to become, uh, for the polyp to become cancerous. Polyps come in different shapes and sizes. Some of them are on a stalk, some of them like, look like mushrooms, and some of them are very inconspicuous and flat that other tests can't pick them up. This is why uh, colonoscopy is the best screening test, because if you can't see it with the naked eyes, um, uh, without magnification, then you can imagine other tests will not be able to pick it up. Polyps are usually asymptomatic and rarely cause uh, symptoms. Uh, they rarely cause uh, blockage. They rarely cause any bleeding, uh, because uh, the reason why is because it has not really advanced yet and it has not become cancerous yet. This is why colorectal cancer is a silent killer. <clears throat> a little bit of statistics on polyps. Polyps, uh, when, when you think about polyps, you know, we talk about uh, cancer all the time, but 30% of adults over the age of 50 already have polyps in the colon. And 40% of those 30% have multiple polyps. This is where why uh, doing a colonoscopy, full colonoscopy is, is uh, recommended to clear the entire colon and rectum to make sure you don't have any other polyps elsewhere. Now, if polyps are this common, i.e. if 30% if of adults have polyps, the question I have for you is, are you polyp free? A lot of people have a hard time answering this question. And the reason being is because we don't know, unless you get sco uh, scoped and uh, have these polyps removed. How do you screen for polyps? Now, we all know that polyps take a long time, and as I said earlier, anywhere from five to 10 years to become cancerous. So we take advantage of this lag time, this time between when the polyp becomes cancerous, to scope the patients, remove the polyps before the polyps become cancerous. When the polyp is removed, cancer is prevented, and the clock is reset, so to speak. Colonoscopy is the best screening test. There's no other comparable test. All the other tests just detect cancer, they don't prevent cancer. So I think the public has to understand that. If you remove the polyps, the polyps will never become cancer again. And that's important to understand. So who should get screened? It is estimated that 50 to 60 percent of eligible adults are currently being scoped right now. As you all know, we have a national initiative uh, with the American Cancer Society to get 80 percent screening rate by, by 2018. And that campaign is ongoing right now. Um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends that asymptomatic patients, which is you and I who are asymptomatic, or average risk patients, which is you and I who has no family history of colorectal cancer or colorectal polyps, uh, should be screened at the age of 50. However, 
the American College of Gastroenterologists, American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, and American College of Physicians recommend that African Americans get screened at the age of 45. The reason for that is not well understood, but we do know that, however, that African Americans tend to present at a more advanced stage. So we figured if we can scope them earlier, maybe we can catch these polyps earlier before they turn into cancer. Now, those patients who have a first degree relative uh, with colorectal cancer or polyps should be screened at the age of 40, or 10 years younger than the first degree relative at diagnosis. So now, for instance, if your brother had colon cancer at the age of 40, you should be scoped at the age of 30. So that's important, and I, and I want to stress also, it's not just colorectal cancer, it's polyps. If you have polyps, what happens sometimes is that folks get scoped, and they totally have polyps, they think they're fine. No, your family, uh, families are still at risk of developing colorectal cancer, because you don't know whether the polyp will ever become cancerous. So therefore, you have to let your family know that they need to be scoped uh, as well. So for those who unfortunately did not have their polyps removed and end up with uh, cancer on the right here, um, uh, so how common is, is uh, colorectal cancer? Colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in both men and women behind lung cancer and breast cancer for women and lung cancer and prostate cancer for men. It is the second most common cause of cancer deaths in the United States in both men and women combined. And yet, this is a very preventable cancer. One in three people diagnosed with colorectal cancer die from it. So that's one third of the people. And the good thing is, is only one in 20 people have lifetime risk of, the, of getting colorectal cancer. That's 5% of the population. On the other hand, polyps are higher. The incidence of polyps are higher. It's about anywhere from six out of 20 people, uh, or, uh, 30, which is about 30% of adults above the age of 50. So risk factors. Now, I always think that we have the power over our risk, or, or the power of reducing our risks and basically changing our risk factors. Obviously, age you can't change, uh, like we all talked about before. Over 90% of all colorectal cancer tends to occur after the age of 50. And if we said that 30 to 40% of patients over the age of 50 have polyps, I know aging is nice and all, but you don't have to keep your polyp. You don't have to have cancer. So you want to age graciously, so you want to undergo colonoscopy, remove the polyps before you become cancerous. Diet, diet is very important, okay? Uh, especially uh, red meat, those who like to eat a lot of smoked, uh, open flame meats, uh, high cooked meat. Um, you know, there has been association of colorectal cancer with uh, red meat, because think about this. Uh, red meat has iron, and iron is a pro-oxidant, uh, which can lead to injuries to uh, the colonics, uh, uh, colonocytes, which is the cells on the colon over time. And people who tend to eat a lot of red meat don't eat a lot of fruits and vegetables um, because you know, that's just how they are. This is the land of meats and potatoes. Um, now, also, the other thing you want to know is that pork is not the other white meat, okay? Um, it is uh, a red meat. Uh, you want to limit the amount of meats that are processed. Uh, the only processed meats include sausages, bacons, and salamis, and hot dogs. Uh, these things are, are cured and preserved with chemicals that can be injurious to your colon size. Colonocytes. Um, now, fiber is an important part of, of our diet, and you know, this is what we're supposed to be eating anyway. We need about 25 to 35 grams of fiber a day. Uh, what fiber does is fiber helps you to clean up all the toxins and help you have frequent, nice, complete bowel movements without uh, having stools stick around in your colon for too long. Can you imagine all the toxins you eat? Uh, the more you have it sitting in your colon for a long period of time, the longer time that your colonocytes are exposed to these toxins over time. So you want to eat enough uh, fiber, like, like I said, again, it's 25 to 35 grams a day. Lifestyle. What is it in our lifestyle? You know, we're talking about lifestyle, obesity, and, and uh, our body habit is, uh, it is, it has been shown that there is 33% uh, increased risk of colorectal cancer with BMI over 30, and you want to avoid sedentary lifestyle, you want to exercise at least 30 minutes a day, um, uh, because, you know, that's, that's important. Uh, you want to quit smoking. Uh, smoking is uh, a very important part of uh, co colorectal cancer development. It's not just colorectal cancer, any kind of cancer, whether it be skin cancer, whether it be uh, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, because what happens is when you smoke, uh, carcinogens are delivered into the lung, lungs and it's carried all over the body, and anywhere it deposits, it can cause injuries to the, to the cells in that area and cause those cells to become angry at some point. If it lands on the blood cells, it can get leukemia. If it lands on the lymph nodes, it can get lymph lymphoma. If it lands on the breast, if it lands on, on uh, the prostate, uh, it can get prostate cancer. If it lands on the colon, it can get colon cancer. Just the list goes on and on. 
Uh, there's at least 40 compounds that are found to be injurious or detrimental to, uh, to our body that uh, smoking contains. Uh, some of them like benzene and hydrocarbons and mono uh, carbon monoxide, to name a few, are very injurious. So, um, and we're not just talking about uh, primary smoking, which is just you smoking. We're talking about secondary smoking, meaning if you're inhaling all the people who smoke, you're basically enjoying their, their, their habits, so to speak. You know, some of us will go to bars and clubs and you come home, your clothes smell like, uh, like tobacco and all that. All that smoke that's in the air, you're inhaling that. So you have to think about it, have to, uh, keep, keep that in mind. So um, uh, alcohol, um, on the other hand, also uh, has been associated with uh, cardiac cancer. And uh, they said to uh, limit uh, uh, just uh, three drinks a day for men and one for women. So where do we go from here? Um, one thing that we all have to be is ambassadors. We have to be our brother's keeper. Uh, you want to get yourself screened. You want to remember that coronal cancer is preventable because if it's caught at the polyp stage, you have 100% survival. If it's caught at stage one, you have 90% survival in five years. So, you know, you want to get this done as early as possible. It is treatable because guess what? If, if uh, in stage one, you have 90% survival, it is beatable because as of today, we have one million survivors. And that's uh, something to be very happy about. So now you want to know your family history. Um, you want to talk about this. Remember, family secrets kill families. So you want to keep secrets. Some people uh, don't know that their father had polyps and they keep like a secret. We should be talking about this every day. This is what life is about. We want to help each other out. All right. So let's catch this silent killer together. Get involved. You can join our polyp, Are You Polyp Free campaign that we started here at South Nassau. Now, having said that, thank you very much. I want to introduce our patient here, uh, Ms. Jason. Thank you, Dr. Joy, for introducing um, to the public. Um, I'm, um, my name is Colleen Jason. I'm 51 years old. Um, a cancer survivor. Last summer, I went to my primary physician. who actually asked me, um, "You just turned 50. You really encouraged me to have a colonoscopy." Which I thought, you know, okay, a colonoscopy, I'll do it. But uh, deep in my mind, thinking like nothing can happen to me because I'm in good health and you know, I say, all right, but I, I did listen to him. I say, okay, I'll think about it and I'll do it. And then um, when I met Dr. Amajoy, and um, he spoke to me about um, the, uh, about um, colorectal cancer. And I say, okay, I'll just, I'll do it. And then I'm thinking I'm a true optimistic. I think nothing can go wrong, you know, but let me just do it. So, in the um, beginning of July, I went under colonoscopy. Um, actually, the first prep wasn't that great, but the second time, and he told me they did find something. And I was like, I, I can't believe this. I almost like fell out of the chair. <laughs> and he said to me, you got to go under surgery. So, that was like an uh, emergency. So, and I decided to go. And August 24th, I walked in this hospital with a team, of, a great team, a staff, wonderful staff. When I went under surgery, and then five days later, August 28th, I went home. It was my 30th anniversary, so I get to celebrate that. That was a big, <laughs> this rejoice mm -hmm. from that. And then if I didn't do it, I don't know what will happen. You heard what Dr. Armandroy said. So I truly believe like um, prevention is key. You might think you're 50 years old, you're healthy, nothing gonna happen to you. And then the next thing you know, you end up in a hospital having surgery. And I'm very grateful, forever grateful for that to have me And he saved my life. And the whole team, this hospital, was wonderful to me. And I'm forever grateful. And I thank you so much. Questions here? Any questions coming over the transom? So Joe, we have a live question for us? You can, and if in fact any questions in the audience, we'll certainly entertain. So Dr. Alan can you talk about capsule endoscopy as an alternative? Obviously it's not procedural, but for people who are totally afraid of colonoscopy. Well, it's not uh, they have, there's not enough data on capsule endoscopy for screening. Uh, 
uh, because the resolution is not as good at this Why don't time. you explain first what that is, because there may be people in our Facebook it, audience. It, it, it's it's basically a pill that a patient swallows that has cameras in it, all around it, that takes several pictures uh, while it's in the colon and, and tries it in until you poke it out, basically. <laughs> so uh, there's not enough data to suggest uh, capsaicin dust code as the uh, uh, screening test of choice at this time. Uh, we're still working on it. But it is used and sometimes... Uh, um, it actually, it's not, it's not recommended at this time. Right? So uh, Colonoscopy yeah. yeah. is a gold standard, and all the other tests is not as good. Okay, so um, I would tell, like I was telling my wife, you know, uh, uh, the uh, colonoscopy is what I recommend for my mother, but if you don't like your mother-in-law, the other test is good <laughs> for her. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, um, so I hope that paints a picture in your mind. Okay, so. One more thing that one of the biggest things about colonoscopy deterrent is the prep. And people say, what about virtual colonoscopy, which is a CAT scan, a computerized way of looking at the colon. But they don't realize they have to do a prep for that also. So you can't escape the prep. Yeah. And, and, and in, in addition to what Dr. said, they have these kits out now to see them advertised on TV. Go to your medical doctor, get a script, and you take this kit, and mail it away. I, I, that's not as well as the colonoscopy. Well, yeah, let, let me talk. Because that's a great question, by the way. Uh, it looks like you, uh, that's a good question. All right, so you know, she's talking about the fecal blood testing, also the uh, FIT test, which is the uh, fecal immunohistochemical testing, and also the Cologuard, which is brand new. The Cologuard is the test for blood and the DNA that is shed by polyps or cancer. Uh, the fecal cup blood test just tests um, blood in the stool, and the FIT test tests hemoglobin. Uh, the problem with that is, remember what I said, polyps rarely bleed, and they, they rarely cause symptoms. If you're not bleeding today, you got you, you take a stool and there's no blood, uh, does that mean you don't have polyp? It doesn't mean that. So if you if you were negative today and you check it again next year, it's negative. So you're really waiting to get cancer if you think about that because you're waiting for it to, to advance before it becomes positive and then you go for, for colonoscopy. So why, why do that? The whole idea is to prevent cancer. You're not waiting to get cancer. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Alvatore, can you just tell everyone, because I know during your presentation you touched on it, how is a polyp actually removed? Oh, that's a good question. And I had a video here, but I don't think you played. But uh, what, what, what happens is, is the polyp can be removed in several ways. It can just be biopsy with a little bias, uh, faucet biopsy, or it can be removed with a snare. Okay, a snare, uh, what happens is when you see the polyp, the snare uh, circles around the polyp, and then with cutter, you can cauterize the base of the polyp as you come out and the polyp is removed. And once that polyp is removed, that polyp will never grow again. And that's the beauty of this. I've never seen any other test better than colonoscopy. Mammogram is not better than colonoscopy because mammogram detects cancer, right? Colonoscopy prevents cancer. Colonoscopy prevents cancer. Um, so that's... So that, that, it's not surgery. It's that's not surgery. The, the only time it's surgery if there's a polyp, especially in Ms. Jason's case, the polyp was so big, it was large enough that any, any attempt to do it through the scope will cause a hole. Uh, it would be too dangerous to try to remove that uh, during the colonoscopy, so what she ended up having is uh, surgery, and do robotic assisted uh, colectomy, uh, which is what she needed because as polyps get bigger and bigger, the chance of them harboring cancer within them goes higher. So you don't know. So that's another reason why I don't go surgery as well. So that way, if it's truly cancerous, if it's hiding cancers within it, you've already done the surgery and she's good. And then can you just comment on the difference between a patient? why they'd seek you out as a colorectal surgeon versus a gastroenterologist? I'm sorry, can you answer the question again? Why would, uh, just how does a patient get to you as a colorectal surgeon versus a gastroenterologist? Um, I think a lot of it, a lot of it is uh, referrals from primary care physicians and I, it's all about me going out there knocking at doors and get people to know who I am because uh, you, that's a good question by the way because a lot of primary care docs have no idea what we do. Uh, as colorectal surgeons, you know, uh, colonoscopy is, is like 33% of my practice is sort of uh, what we like to do because if we find something, then we can remove that and, you know, 
it's a one-stop shop kind of deal, and the patient doesn't have to travel several places uh, to meet others. But hey, uh, it's only one of us, and with a few of us, it's not a whole lot of us. So we need our gastroenterology counterparts uh, to help us out. Um, and you know, it, you know, it's just uh, it's a matter of educating the patients. And so, uh, if we have time, if we have the opportunity, we're on our scope. Thank you. Done. Yeah. Um, you say the clock is reset. How many years later should another clock? Another great question. Another great. So it depends on how many polyps and the size of the polyp. If let's say, for instance, there are three polyps that was found on the initial colonoscopy, you need to be scoped like two or three years afterwards. If it's one polyp, five years. Okay. If the polyp is very big, you may have to come back in one month, in one year, or six months, depending on what the doctor had to do. Sometimes pops are so big that it has to remove piecemeal, meaning you remove some part of it and you have to come back to remove the other. Um, and you know, sometimes the doctor wanna come back and look at it six months later to make sure there's nothing residual uh, left behind. Uh, so it all depends, you know, there's no real strict guidelines, but it depends on what the doctor understands and what they're dealing with. All right, do we have any questions from our social media team? Several, actually. Good, all right. Great questions here. All right, oh, we have a question from uh, the town of Hempstead, Supervisor Santino. How important is colon health and awareness to our community? Um, it is. It is very important. Um, you know, I you know I always tell my, my residents that you know the great work for a doctor is a teacher, and we owe the community the opportunity to always teach them. Because right, that's our role. If you really think about it, PhDs are called doctors too, they're teachers. So um, what we should be doing is doing this on a regular basis, talking to people. Because the more we talk about this, the more people feel comfortable doing this test. That's why we term this talk, are you polyp free? Polyp don't get a lot of, a lot of publicity at all. And but that's, if you understand polyp, then you're not afraid of finding something. You want to go ahead and go get screened because you know that you'll be okay. If you have this part removed on time, instead of waiting along, around and waiting till like uh, like a six or seven when the pops are already big or have become cancerous, so I think uh, teaching the, the community is super important, and that's what we should be doing and living every single day. Certainly doing it today. Uh, on that on that note, uh, how many people here are friends of our Facebook page? All right, very good. So this is streaming live on the page. It will live on the page, and you can share it. As you know, how Facebook works. So we've had posts uh, this morning that you can share, and, and after this is over as well. That's certainly one way that we can all educate each other. All right, here's another question uh, via social media. I have a family history of colon cancer. I've been screened every two years, starting at age 40. Now that I'm 50, do I still need to be screened every two years, or can I go five years? Well, um, I don't know the history, but um it depends on whether there was any polyps found in the initial colonoscopies or prior colonoscopies. Uh, but uh, the recommendation is if there is nothing found, let me kind of digress a little bit. So if you have a family history, you want to be scoped at the age of 40, right? And if it's negative, the recommendation is to scope at a five years interval until uh, it is negative for three consecutive times and then uh, you may proceed every 10 years. Um, but it all depends on what was found. If there was any polyps found, then that interval is decreased. And uh, so I, I have to know a little bit more history to be able to answer all the questions. Of course, the, the real answer is to go see your physician if you have any, any questions about that. Uh, my father had colon cancer and passed away after a five year battle with cancer. He was diagnosed at 42. I'm about to turn 32. Should I uh, already be getting a colonoscopy? The answer is yes. Um, I'm assuming that there's no family history of Lynch syndrome, uh, which if that's the case, uh, you should be getting scoped by age of 25. But if, if that's not the case, you should be scoped 10 years younger than the first degree relative who had uh, the colorectal cancer. So at age of 32, you should be getting scoped right now. Right. We're still coming in. We got more questions. One more. 
are probiotics a good prevention for colorectal cancer? This came in via Twitter. Um, there is really not much data on that. Um, I think it's all about having nice colon health. I think what happens is those who tend to do probiotics also uh, do a lot of fiber. Uh, when you combine fiber with probiotics, uh, it tends to help a lot because if you remember what I said, fiber allows you to have nice complete bowel movements. So um, there has been some patients that you x-ray the abdomen and you see stools that are still there from two weeks ago or a week ago. Um, so the more nice complete bowel movement you have, the less you expose the lining of your colon to toxins that are in the, in the colon, especially those who eat a lot of those meats, smoked meats and, and uh, meats cooked in open flame. Think about what you're doing. You're basically uh, exposing the meat to all the flame. And what, what happens to smoke? What's in smoke? Think about what's in smoke. All the aromatic amines, all the carcinogens are deposited on this, on this food. And then you ingest it. If it sits in your colon for a long period of time, over, year, over the years, week after week, over the years, as you eat this and make it a habit of doing for a long period of time, you keep exposing the lining of your colon to, angry, uh, to get angry from these carcinogens and that can uh, lead to mutation, that can lead to power formation, and from power formation, all the mutation can cause the power to lead to cancer. Very good, very interesting. We're still coming in here. All right, we got another Twitter question via Twitter. Uh, how much and how frequently alcohol consumption would increase your risk of colorectal cancer? Um, the answer to that I think I have here because it's a percentage. And um, it is, they said three drinks a day had 41% risk of developing colorectal cancer. So the recommendation uh, for you over at Twitter is if you're a man, it is not more than three drinks, I mean two drinks per day. And for beers, it's 12 ounces. And for wine, it's five ounces. For a woman, it's just one, one per day. Okay. All right. One more, is this last one? This was from the audience. Oh, okay. okay. How does someone get in touch with uh, Dr. Dita or Amjoy to make an appointment? How do you make an appointment? That's a good question. <laughs> You can call the Cancer Center, 516-632-3350. All right, and with that, uh, I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely having a salad for lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I want to thank Carlene in particular for sharing her story with us. Uh, We will be monitoring the cafeteria. Who's going to have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. No. I'm meeting my wife. Thank you. I'll call her for lunch. I've got a meeting about me. Oh, okay.